Good afternoon, everyone. This is Amy Dacey. I'm the Executive Director of the Science Institute of Policy and Politics at American University. I'm also the former CEO of the DNC. So yes, my first convention was in 96. I've been to a few in various roles. We're going to give you an insider's guide, talking to some of our top experts, some delegates that are alumni um, that are joining us as well. And we're going to talk to everybody about what, what to expect in this, uh, as we kick off convention week, uh, a virtual convention. Um, so let me get right to our guests because we want to hear from them right away. Uh, first of all, we have Mathoni Wambukral, who is the National Political and Organizing Director of the DNC. Hello, Mathoni. Thank you for joining us. She has her colleague with her today, Taylor Barnes, who's the Deputy Political and Organizing Director at the DNC. We've got Susan Swecker, who is the Chairwoman of the Virginia Democratic Party, who's joining us today as well. And we have Kyle Anderson, who is the Director of Media Relations for the convention in 2016. So everybody's perspective is so unique and different and amazing. But first of all, thank you so much for your time. I know you're doing a million other virtual things um, as we speak this week. But I guess we'll just start off with a brief intro from you. And if you would just talk about what conventions you may have been to, you know, some of the roles and what you'll be doing for the 2020 convention. I think if we could start off with the chairwoman. Hello, Susan, welcome. Hey, dear friend, Amy, it's so good to see you. And um, even virtually, even, even though virtually. we can't be together, but um, I, rem I remember our 2004 convention. We were yes. working together then. I was John Kerry's state director in Virginia and you were on the national campaign, which is how I got to know the amazing Amy Dacey. <laughs> and that's one of the best things I want to say about um, democratic politics is you make lifelong friends and we truly are a small pond. Um, and it's just, it's really meaningful. But my first, my first convention was 1988. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the elder on the call, I guess. You're the senior was, member of the delegation here, Susan. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was exec, I, I, I'm going in many different roles. So that, I, I, I was executive director of the Democratic Party that year. Uh, and it was in Atlanta. And um, so I have, I have gone as a guest. I have gone as a DNC member, as a John Kerry staff. Yeah. staffer and then this is the second time i've been chairwoman uh, i was the chair in 2016 and then here we are now in this uh, challenging environment but listen i'm proud of our virginia democrats and our and our democrats in every state in the dnc of how we uh pivoted how quickly yeah. uh tom perez and the biden joe biden and his team uh said look we're going to keep you safe and healthy and still get our business done. We believe in science as opposed to the, you know, clown show on the other side. Yeah. Well, thank you, Susan. And, and why don't we go to one of those operatives, one of those staff people who's been like doing this work and, and amazing, like you said, for all of you, both on the Democratic and Republican side, this has evolved where you had set out a year ago. These things, people don't understand how early the planning goes into a convention when you don't know that much. You don't know who the nominees are. You don't know what the city's going to be yet. So, Mathoni, you are organizing, organizing. How are you doing this? And I know you've had a lot of different roles at conventions. So tell me just a little bit about your background and, and what brought you to this convention. Well, look, I my first convention was actually in 92. Uh, and it was in New York City, which is where I uh, grew up. And uh, I was a volunteer. Um, and, you know, under the incredible leadership of uh, the late, great Ron Brown. Mm -hmm. And I not only did that convention help me for the first time to really understand what the Democratic Party was really about, because, you know, while I grew up the kid of sort of two very active educators, I never had the big picture. Uh, and, it, you know, if you aren't inside of the party, that is in and of itself sort of its own different world and ecosystem. And, you know, and so there's a lot of ways that we all participate and connect to politics. This was my first time uh, connecting to it through the Democratic Party, and I was sold. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I have been to almost every convention since then. It is my great regret that I was not in Chicago, but um, every other time, including when Amy Dacey was my boss. Uh, and <laughs> We had LA, uh, and I've worked for Amy Dacey twice, y'all. And uh, one win, of the most win. amazing things. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so um, we are doing as we have always done, and I think the chairwoman would, would echo this. This convention is one of our biggest organizing moments. It is one of those times where, you know, really uh, sort of everything kind of gets put out in front of people in a way that they may not normally participate with parties uh, in this country. And so beyond our individual states, this is about our national moment. Uh, and we are hopefully, hopefully, hoping to take care of, uh, sorry, take advantage of every single opportunity there is. Uh, and that is uh, in particular because we think that there will be so many eyes on this convention. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And in some ways, people are arguing this virtual, you know, circumstance might open the door to more people to be involved. And so um, I, you know, I have to ask, uh, Taylor, what's your, I, I, what's your experience, you know, been with conventions? Yeah, so just, I mean, Mathoni couldn't put it better. The stage is actually much bigger this time with a virtual convention. Obviously, we miss, you know, seeing each other all at the end of tonight and the homecoming aspect of this, but it's much more uh, available to folks that never would, you know, fly out to a convention city, participate in programming during the day. The great yeah. thing is now they, they really can go to, uh, I, I got to give my plug here, uh, events.demconvention.com, <laughs> watch any of the caucus and council meetings uh, and, and participate in the chat, you know, see their favorite speakers. We, you know, just last night in, in the chat box, we had Representative Terry Sewell and Chair Tom Perez chatting back and forth with folks. So the good news is it's a lot easier for people to actually see the political party process up close and personal in a way that just wasn't, uh, wasn't feasible for most Americans before the virtual convention. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because one of the audiences for a convention is certainly delegates, it's activists, it's, but you know, these were always party meetings. They just started out as party meetings, but they've become kind of this media spectacle, if you will. And this is my lead up to you, Kyle, because I mean, in your role in 2016 in Philadelphia, like you had to do this, like what is, first of all, what is the background and what is your, you know, I mean, you were actually on campaign staff in that city for the whole probably year before. Right. What has your convention experience been? So first of all, I want to uh, thank you for the invitation to serve with, to speak with such an amazing group of uh, of women. It is um, it's an honor to be here. And when you uh, when you asked, I was of course um, everyone needs an Amy Dacey in their life. She's a problem solver, and she's the person that you go to to get things done. So let me just say that um, my ex my background is in communications. I spent eight years um, doing comms for uh, congressional committees, and I also spent some time in the private sector doing diversity communications. 2016 was actually my first convention. Um, and wow. so uh, it was my first convention. Um, and, and I originally turned down the opportunity because I just didn't know, I had just moved back to Philadelphia, which is my home. Um, yep. So it was, it was uh, just fortuitous that I happened to be there, but I just didn't think I could make it, make it work. And uh, I just didn't understand what a big deal this, this was to be asked to participate in something of that magnitude. And so um, after, some friends in uh, in DC told me, "Are you crazy? You have to." <laughs> That's actually not how they said it. They said it with a lot more colorful DC language, but I'm <laughs> um, I, I, I'm really lucky to to jump on and managing that kind of press operation with such amazing, talented people was just one of the best things that I've ever done um, in my in my career. Um, it was gratifying to be part of building something that 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 was so important. Um, and something that at the time was the most diverse convention in our history. So that was just, um, it was an amazing experience and being behind the scenes with that was something that I will never forget. I hope everyone has an opportunity to, to do that at some point because it's just, it really makes, it, it helps you understand uh, how our system works and it helps you understand the different relationships and things and how we actually um, get things done. So it was an amazing experience and one that I am really thankful for having been convinced to finally do after uh, yeah. it came to my senses. We're so grateful you said yes eventually and that your friends were colorful in their explanation <laughs> about why you should do this, right? So we're gonna yeah, we're gonna definitely ask you more about the, the role. But I will say this, when we're talking about audiences, we have 50 states and territories, state parties all coming to, to convene on this virtually. But it's really interesting, Susan, because you've seen it virtual, you've done it in person. 
there's actually party business that happens at these conventions. For some people, they think it's the speeches because that's what they've seen the outward facing. How are you getting your party business done in this virtual world? Like, how did you traditionally do it and how are you doing it now? Can you just unmute for a minute, Susan? Because we're, we're missing out on your good words here. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that's okay. We're all getting used to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a little technically challenged on a lot of <laughs> stuff. But um, you yeah, won't be so after this. Normally, and, that's for you know, sure. You know, you'd use 16 for an example where um, we still weren't unified as a party. And you had, um, you know, discussion on the platform and a minority report. You had... Um, you know, you can also have challenges on the floor with, you know, rules and credentials and you're, you know, we did all of that. We were forced to do change, make a pivot, but it was seamless. And I really applaud again, Tom Perez and his leadership um, to move and with the rules and bylaws committee to make the changes needed to conduct business. So instead of you know, having a night or an afternoon where the platform was going to come up or the rules for the convention comes up on the front end. Um, we did this all ahead of time and, and we voted ahead of, ahead of the week before. I think it was August 11th through the 15th. You, you know, you cast your ballot uh, up or down and we made, we made those changes early. We did a lot of education with our delegations uh, on, on how and what to do it. And, you know, is it the sexiest thing in the world? <laughs> no, but it's really important. And um, I think that one of the gratifying things to me this time is that, yeah, we still have some differences because we've always been that big tent party and welcome people. But we all know that like our biggest end goal is to get that criminal enterprise out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. You know, we are going to uh, unite behind whoever, albeit there is a lot of excitement with this historic generational ticket of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, right? I mean, really, what a story. But that um, where, you know, the reports coming out of the floor, you know, so, somebody in the media was always going to go and find somebody disgruntled or somebody unhappy and report that back, right? I think that even if we were in person, you'd still have some of that, but that by virtually we are, we are even more united and, um, and, and, and understand that our democracy is really at stake. So, so yeah, and, and I was going to say, we also elect, um, the day after the convention, are all of the new Democratic National Committee members right. are, are come on board. So there's a there's a change there. Yeah. So here's one question for you, Susan, just as a follow up. You did a lot of that business because the party, literally the conventions, you have to nominate your candidate and you have to agree to the party platform, right? Like those are the two mm -hmm. main pieces of business. Mm -hmm. But also state parties meet every day and they talk about what they're going to do in the state. Like how are you meeting with your delegation during this time? Because <laughs> You know, traditionally, the jump off from the convention is you all go back to your states, and then it's that hard push up until election day. So how are you meeting with your delegations during this so, week? So, I mean, and that's one of the things that's been ever since March, middle of March, when we were shut down, we had to really quickly pivot um, to do uh, uh, conventions uh, and a state convention, but CD conventions, and, you know, which started the whole process based on the vote of our presidential primary. So our staff became um, very, very good at uh, Zoom meetings and go to meetings and all that. So we, we kind of felt like we were in a good place. But, but I will tell you, I was on nonstop conference calls, Zoom meetings on how to do this. Yeah. And that's the same, we just haven't let up. Everything that we would do in person, we're doing now virtually and we're just doing more of it. We're also, I don't mean to filibuster this whole panel or anything, but we are trying very, very hard to, especially for our first time delegates and our pages to like, how do we make this exciting and fun for them? So we had a happy hour last evening with a trivia, political trivia. Well, I gotta tell you, Congressman Bobby, Bobby Scott, He's really good at this stuff. <laughs> it, was he the winner last night? He had a lot. He, I don't think. I don't think his team won, but he had. He was really good right and on. very competitive. Okay. Good to know. He's the one you want on your team when you're doing a little political trivia. <laughs> exactly. Well, Susan, that's really important. And, and again, the state party, like literally the nuts and bolts of turnout and, and, and everything is important. Um, you know, it's very interesting. In your lady's titles, it's political and organizing director. And a lot of times, people don't realize. 
the constituency groups meet, the caucuses and councils, you know, have these meetings to talk about organizing in, in different groups. How are you all working on that and making sure that people who feel connected to those groups, like Susan said, especially if it's their first time experience? Um, well, first of all, I would like to pick up on what the chairwoman said uh, and just reemphasize how fun Democrats are. I just want to underline that. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think that's really important because we're about to talk to you about all of the ways in which people can participate, uh, get involved, see some of this programming. I'm going to let Taylor share more about that. Uh, but I want folks to know that the theme for our convention is Uniting America. Uh, and it is, um, you know, it, it, it is so apropos of the moment. Um, and you are going to see reflected in this convention just how big this tent has grown now that people are faced with a powerful contrast in our choices. And I am excited for people to hear about our values, to see who represents this party, to better understand the level and the breadth of diversity um, throughout the Democratic Party. Um, the roll call for our convention is going to take viewers to all 57 states and territories they are going to hear from delegates, from parents, from teachers, from small business owners, essential workers, activists, and elected leaders to our Democratic Party. Um, they are going to hear from our party uh, in all of its many facets. And they are going to hear us all uh, as these folks cast their votes to, uh, for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Um, and inside of these meetings, Amy, as you well know, I mean, there is just such amazing programming that is taking place. Taylor has been marshalling all of our team. Uh, and look, it's been tough. Like, you know, pivoting uh, to make this virtual convention sing um, was required all of our heft, but we're built for this. This is what we do. We are organizers at our core and making sure that people get what they need. The moment we understand that the situation calls for something different, all the nuts and bolts here. This is what you gave me when I took this job, Amy, and I have kept it with me ever since. <laughs> and that is how our chairwoman came in. I was at her a state party convention when an entire thunderstorm came and knocked out all of her. <laughs> And the, algae and the the largest thunderstorm ever just comes flying through. Do you think that that stopped that state convention? No, <laughs> not for a moment. So Taylor, you can tell us more about uh, the incredible caucus and council meetings and our other partners who are doing stuff as well. Yeah, no. So the exciting part is that the political team, our you know Masoni and my team, we have uh, 32 events spread throughout the week. So really, there is there is a oh my gosh, I'm so distracted by your extremely cute dog, Kyle. A little Georgia joined us. Hi, Georgia. Those, those are some of my post-convention plans, guys. I might need to be talked to wait until after November, but, you know, we'll see where my heart takes me after, on Friday. Um, so we have 32 different meetings that our team is producing, and, and these are so exciting. You know, these, are, these are Muslim delegate assemblies with 32 different speakers. You know, the Hispanic Caucus is actually going on right now, and they're talking about the impact that COVID has had on the Latinx community. So we're doing some really intersectional, interesting conversations that these caucus and council meetings really give us the space to do. Um, and, you know, like I said, they're more accessible than ever before. The one thing I, I want to mention is the virtual uh, experience allows us to capture people's emails. You know, before, we didn't know if folks were watching on Facebook Live, if folks walked into the room. Now we have their name and email, and we can, you know, and we know which caucus and council meeting they, they attended, so we know how to target them and what issues they're most interested in, you know, when we're really looking to engage people after the convention. Um, so, you know, those are the, the real big pieces I want to pull out that are just so exciting. Uh, and outside of that, you know, we have over 100 uh, partner events taking place that are also being promoted on the, on the DEM convention website. So, you know, we're really, uh, and, and shout out to the team at the DEM convention for really trying to make that as much of a hub as it can be so that we're showcasing both the official programming and the unofficial programming hosted by partners that is really so much fun uh, on traditional convention years, also fun virtually this year. Well, it's exciting. So, so traditionally, if people weren't at the convention, they watch the speeches at night. But what you're saying, Taylor, is 
go to the convention website, you can follow along, go to one of these, you know, meetings, go to one of these partner events and, and feel connected in, in a way, especially with some of these affinity groups. So that's exactly right. All of that content uh, and exciting things and, you know, inside speakers was all only available to the people that could afford to buy a plane ticket and fly to the convention city or, you know, live there. Now it's open to every single person in the states and territories and we get their email. So that's really the exciting part for us uh, as we think about our organizing efforts into the fall. And the other thing I wanna say is that our Biden counterparts are really doing their own programming that we're uh, promoting cross constituency. So, you know, I, I'm uh, privileged to run the Women's Caucus on the Cher Lottie Shackleford. So when I'm promoting Women's Caucus events, I'm also promoting our Women for Biden watch parties that have celebrities like Jamie Lee Curtis, Denai Guerrera uh, happening at night too. So. There's just so much cross promotion uh, and, and we're really excited about that partnership with the Biden campaign as well. It's so exciting. I'm glad you shared that because sometimes people's perspective is, you know, these big events at night, balloons drop, but there's a lot more going on at conventions. You know, it's interesting, Kyle, the chairwoman brought up, you know, the media used to just walk out, talk to delegates, had access, got real time, you know, reactions from, from either, you know, people who were um, part of the support groups or, you know, actual delegates or DNC members. Like the work you did in 2016 for the media and for them to be connected, how do you think that's going to work this time? Do you think they're going to have more access, less access? I'm very curious because they're another huge audience for this event. They are. So I think one of the, first of all, I think the party has done an amazing job in pivoting and, uh, and adapting to unprecedented circumstances. So I don't think we can speak highly enough about the work that they've done. Um, I think that one of the, 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 one of the reasons why they're able to pivot so quickly is that we are a large sort of large tent party and we do focus on what's going on in communities. And so a lot of the press is going to, well, there's absolutely press in Milwaukee, a lot of the press um, availability is going to be back in neighborhoods and communities where Democrats actually are and where they're gonna have all these different surrogates. So the conversations that I've had with my friends who are out there now is that as opposed to it being a very centralized um, effort like it was in 2016, and I think it's been, it has been in the past, the, uh, the outreach is much more sort of community, state, neighborhood focused so that uh, to, to Taylor's point, more folks in communities are able to access information and able to participate in this, as opposed to, as she mentioned again, uh, having to buy a ticket and, and, and stay in a hotel and have somewhat limited access. So I think the press is also going to be taking advantage of that. I have friends who are back in Philadelphia who would not have been able to cover it. Um, minority media and ethnic minority media that are going to now have new opportunities to cover it because everything's going to be virtual. So it drives the, ex the accessibility down to a level that I think is going to be really impactful and is going to help drive that message home to communities and neighborhoods across the country. So it's interesting, there could be more access. I, I like what you said, some of these, these smaller outlets, maybe even some of these local outlets that still exist, right. who wouldn't be able to make the trip to Milwaukee are gonna be able to talk to their local community about what's going on. Right, they've got all this new access. In the past, they would have gotten feed from, feeds uh, from some of the local, uh, from some of the networks. And then we also made it possible for them to access feed, but this is a way for them to see it firsthand and to participate firsthand in ways that they wouldn't have necessarily been able to in the past. So I think, um, it's been brilliant how they've pivoted and how they've adapted and just, this is what Democrats do. We make the best of bad situations and, or, or not, not favorable situations and, um, and, and find a way to be more inclusive and more, uh, um, and more um, in, involving more folks. So I, I think it's, it's great how they've done that. I think this is amazing. It definitely gives us an idea from hearing from you guys, you know, in, in this unique opportunity to talk to you as we start a convention. There's so much that is like a benefit from virtual and you're, you're capitalizing making the best on it. But let's be honest, I, I will tell you from a personal perspective, some of the things I will miss most are, we call them the ladies and gents of the convention who wear their entire political paraphernalia on the, on the floor, right? Like that's a pretty cool thing. And I love walking out of the convention center and getting any button. I mean, I think I bought, my friend bought me surfers for Clinton, you know, but like, and, and so, how do you, you know, see what is what are the things you're going to miss? But you're obviously making accommodations for. But what are some of the things you're going to miss about not being at an in-person convention? Why don't we start with the chairwoman who's who's been doing them since you know eighty? Yeah. Well, you know, it, 
for me, uh, it's, you know, like a political family reunion. So I just, I miss, you know, seeing folks and uh, trading stories and, 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 and all of that. And I, I gotta say, I love a balloon drop. I mean, I, I really, that balloon drop. <laughs> you, do. Too. you know, so I miss that. But what we've tried to do is like for tomorrow morning, uh, it's funny you say that about the hats and all that. So our, we have, you know, we, we've stuck to the basic schedule and you know, except a little later. So like on the, on the good side, right. I got a good night's sleep last night. <laughs> I didn't have to send, you know, staff wasn't up at five o'clock getting the credentials for the day and nobody's hounding me for floor passes. So floor passes, okay, right. so that's, a that's good the thing. other insider that there were so many friends on Facebook today who said, who just posted who has floor passes for tonight. Like if you don't know what that experience is like, I don't miss that. So yeah, we're the, all you know the most pop. You're the most popular person for that week, right? In your uh, right. in your state, but but then you know the other part. So like this morning, we came up with this idea in our in our delegation breakfast and uh, assigned everybody to wear tomorrow red, white, and blue. Who who else can ha you know ha whatever you know? So we're trying to think of fun things that we can do uh, each day to kind of, you know, step it up because we have, you know, you, you do have like people, especially in your delegation that you can always count on to have that bling on, you know, that is fun and, and trendy and everything. So, you know, it's, um, it, and again, we did that trivia, uh, political, uh, contest, which honestly was so much fun, so much more than I had thought. And it just is, it's really, um, it integrated sort of the generational because, you know, you had old timers on there that knew a lot of the history and then some new folks that weren't quite, but I think it, they, I think it was a history lesson too. So yeah. we're doing the best we can. And we also steal from other states. If somebody else has a good <laughs> idea, man, we are not above taking it. I love it, Susan. I love it. Hey, Kyle, you were in the, you know, in the center of it all moving forward. Like, what are you going to miss? Like, how are you going to connect this time to the convention? Um, believe it or not, I'm going to miss really bad coffee and <laughs> um, late nights. And, um, you know, that was my first convention. And so yeah. um, all of you have been to multiple conventions and been behind the scenes and had a chance to experience that. And you still know how special it is something about being in the room that is just, um, for somebody who had never done that before and seeing how things, how things actually come together. And so I think um, the party is doing a really good job of trying to drive that feeling out into the community, um, out into you know, the rest of the, of the country and into the communities. I think um, you know, the ability to work directly with some of my colleagues who were some of the most amazing, amazing people um, that I have formed lifelong friendships with and still talk to on a daily basis. Now we're, but mostly daily basis. Now we're all doing, those of us who are not involved with convention this year are doing watch parties and, uh, and are going to sort of stay involved in, um, in that way. But there's just something about being in the room. Um, and so, so that's the part that I think I, I will miss. And then also just watching um, how folks are so excited and moved by the different speeches and I mean, these are, these are important moments in history. And when you're in the middle of convention, you don't always take the time to step back and mm -hmm. think, but a good friend of ours, Kiki McLean, was actually mm -hmm. the person who told me, stop what I was doing in the middle of what I was doing and go out and look at what's going on on the floor and listen to the speeches and absorb the moment. And those are the things that I remember. I don't remember the late nights and I don't remember being so tired that you just wanted to curl up in a ball and under a desk and fall asleep, which we did. Um, but <laughs> but I, I just remember just how amazing it felt to be there in 2016 and how amazing it's going to be to be a part of, um, of this one. I mean, this is historic and it's, um, it's exciting. And, and to everyone's point who has mentioned it, this is about the, the soul of our nation. And, and it, it, that is meaningful in a way that goes just beyond it being a political um, statement. Certainly for me, it's, it is extremely meaningful. So. Well, thank you, Kyle. Um, we'll look forward. I want to maybe get in on your watch party, so I'll check in with you. We'll um, talk. Bring Bertie. We'll um, Mithoni Taylor, you can either say what you missed or we've only got a couple minutes here. Do you want to share with people how they can be engaged if they feel like, you know, they want to be more a part of things or? Well, I, I Zoom bombed your chat box with like a lot of links um, <laughs> and, um, and a little bit of like sample highlights for the caucus and council meetings today so people can get a sense of the flavor. Um, but Taylor, um, 
do you want to just let folks know again the um, the links that they can go to to sign up? Yeah, for sure. So all of the daytime programming is available on events.demconvention.com. There you can see which caucuses and councils are today, which are tomorrow, uh, and everything is streamed there live. Also, uh, highly recommend you just check out the hashtag DemConvention, see what's popping, uh, and you know, go go with what sounds fun to you. Thank you all so much. This half hour just flew by. I selfishly, of course, invited you all because I did miss, miss seeing your faces. And we've been through a lot of conventions together. And, and Taylor, I'm, I'm glad I get to meet you virtually as well. Thank you so much. I wish you all the best of luck this week in the work that you're doing. Um, and it, and it de definitely sounds like you're making the most of it. Um, I want to thank Fearless. I want to thank the four of you. Actually, I want to thank the five of you because Georgia did make an appearance. So I, I think she, she's definitely going to be at the watch parties too. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you for your time. Um, we'll say goodbye for now, but um, we'll talk to you again soon. And we'll make sure everybody gets the links and, and ways to, to definitely get involved, Taylor. So thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Amy. Thank Have a great you. week, everyone. Oh, good to see everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you so much. What a great way to start talking about experts, talking to people who have been there. Now we get the opportunity to talk to some of our amazing alumni who are going to be delegates to this conversation. How exciting is that? As a reminder to those who might have just joined, I'm Amy Dacey. I'm the executive director of the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics at American University. I'm a very proud Eagle, having also graduated from the university. But I'm very, very excited to introduce some of our speakers today. Um, we have Rebecca Millett, who's a delegate from Maine, who's joining us. We have Kevin Malachek, who's a delegate from Ohio, who's also joining us, and Carlton Stewart, who's a delegate from Pennsylvania. Um, I'm not going to go into a long bio. I am so glad that you are all here at the start of this virtual convention week. I'm going to give you all kind of a minute to tell us what's your history with conventions? Is this your first? Have you done many? Have you had different experiences? And then also just, I, I will mention, maybe we'll start with you, Rebecca, who definitely got um, a BA and uh, a BS from uh, the School of International Service, I believe, and so a proud Eagle. But Rebecca, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you became a delegate, like what your path has been to some of these conventions, so. Sure. And welcome. Thanks, Thanks Amy. It's really great to be here. Um, this is my first convention. What what a convention to choose to That's first coming. <laughs> yes. Um, but you know, when I was deciding whether I wanted to run to be a delegate, I knew there was a very good chance it was going to be virtual. So uh, I think I was holding out hope that it would be at least some sort of hybrid and personal, but it, it was clear that that was very much um, at risk. Um, so, you know, it's, it's still been amazing. I'm absolutely overwhelmed by the number of um, caucus meetings that are happening and the partner gatherings and the Biden events and the state delegate events. Um, so my week is absolutely probably just as chock-a-block full um, as it would have been if we were there in person. Um, so you want me to talk a little bit about how, how I became a delegate here in Maine? Yeah, I think that would be interesting for some of our viewers. Sure. Because, you know, a lot of people on here and why we wanted you on, not only because you're a proud AU alum, but, you know, people don't always get that opportunity. And so we're trying to give them that insider's view. So how did you become a delegate? Yeah, well, so um, I, you know, in Maine, we still have our caucus, our party caucuses, even though we went to a primary, we decided to still have the caucus. And it was there that we all kind of shuffled around the room to indicate um, who, which candidate we wanted to be um, a delegate for at the state convention. Um, and I decided at that point, well, sure, you know, I would, that could be interesting to do it at the state convention. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of effort to, to do that at the, at the state level. Um, and then they started, the, the state party started sending out um, information about running for a national delegate. And um, we had to gather 25 signatures from other state delegates in order to be on the ballot um, at the, um, at the, for the state election. And I thought, well, you know, why don't I go ahead and do that? 25 doesn't sound onerous. And um, let's see how that goes. This could be really interesting. Um, and so uh, it was a pretty low threshold to, to get those 25 online signatures, because by then clearly we were all being 
um, asked to stay home and, and not go out. Um, and I made the ballot. And at that point, that was the real, that was the, the pivotal point for me to decide, was I really serious? Was I really all in? Because there were a lot of other people who made that threshold as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was only going to be, I think, two elected state delegates for Elizabeth Warren. That was what my candidate was. Yeah, um, we should mention you're a public servant as well, Rebecca, right? We should tell our, our, our uh, viewers that you also are in the state Senate, if I'm correct. I am. Case. Yes, I'm um, in my eighth and final year um, as a state senator for District 29, which is South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and part of Scarborough. Um, and we have term limits here in Maine. So um, this is my last year state senator, but I'm now running for the House. So that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, and so it's interesting because running to be a, a national delegate um, is quite different than running to be a state senator. Uh, I had to be, um, so the Congressional District 1 was the area in which I was um, campaigning by phone to convince other Democrats who had aligned themselves with Senator Warren to vote for me to be their national delegate. Um, and so you, you meet people from a much wider base than you would if you were running for a state Senate um, here in Maine. Uh, we're a pretty small state. Our, our uh, Senate districts are roughly about 35, 36,000 people. Uh, so we're, it, you know, it's, it's, it's what's great about here is that we can knock doors and meet nearly all of our constituents over a period of time. But anyway, so I, uh, I made lots of phone calls on the weekends to other state delegates and talked to them about um, my work um, uh, in support of Senator Warren's campaign um, and to convince them that I would be a good representative for them. And um, indeed, I won. Well, it's very interesting to know that this is your first convention. So we're going to talk a little bit more about your experience and what you're looking at. But next, I really want to talk to Kevin. Um, you're a delegate from Ohio. Uh, tell us a little bit about like your past convention experience and then also, you know, your kind of path to the getting it to be a delegate this year in this virtual convention. Sure. Thanks for having us today here, Amy. So this is my fourth uh, convention, actually. For the last three conventions, I've actually run also the Congressional District Caucus. That's similar to what Rebecca went through in their process. We kind of all meet at a college campus. People have their distinctive selection for whoever they'd like to back for president. And then they run in those specific caucuses to be actually elected as a delegate. And then we, by congressional district in the state of Ohio, depending on how the presidential vote in the primary goes, allocate those delegates per district. So not only was I running the entire caucus here in 2020 in January, and at that point, we had no, no real idea of, of what was going on with coronavirus, except that it was in China. And we all expected we would be seeing everybody in Milwaukee last month. Um, but I also ran as a, a Biden delegate uh, and was the top vote getter on the male side. We, we distribute our delegates also equally between males and females uh, on each of our congressional levels. And then we obviously all, all have, have uh, political uh, leader elected official delegates and also at large delegates as well. So I've been a pledge delegate all four times where I've gone to the, the different conventions. Um, and I'm also, if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are able to win. The state of Ohio will also be a member of the Electoral College uh, this year in, in, in 2020. Oh, very interesting. Yes. Okay. Well, Carlton, we need your perspective from Pennsylvania. And like, is yeah. this your first, middle? How many have you been to? And what's your convention experience? Well, thank you, Amy, for having all of us here today. I think it's a great opportunity for the for the listeners to, to hear our experiences. So this is actually my third uh, convention. My first okay. one was in 2008. Um, at the time, I was working on Capitol Hill for a member of Congress, um, and through the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, I actually landed a spot on the vice presidential candidate's scheduling uh, and advance team. So uh, I was able to- Those are tough jobs. <laughs> yes, it was, yes it, was, it was quite interesting, quite demanding, uh, but it was a fantastic opportunity. I was able to connect and, uh, with, with family friends out there and, and stay with them uh, and travel downtown Denver. Uh, to work with the the team at the headquarters hotel um, to do the scheduling and, and things of that nature for then Senator Joe Biden uh, as the vice presidential nominee. Uh, my second convention was uh, in 2016 in Philadelphia, which uh, I live just outside of Philadelphia in the suburbs. But that was my second convention. And I was kind of more of a spectator at the time. Uh, I was gearing up to run for state committee here in, in the Commonwealth, which is basically the governing body of the state party as it is in, in every other state. Um, and so kind of 
going down there as a spectator. I was, I was fortunate enough to be able to stay in the Pennsylvania Delegation Hotel downtown um, and got to, you know, meet and greet and, you know, rub elbows with a lot of uh, interesting folks and elected officials and also attend, fortunately, every night of the convention. So um, that, that was a very interesting and unique opportunity. Uh, my path this year is a little bit different. Uh, I am now an elected member of state committee. Um, so through that avenue, um, I was asked by the Biden campaign to be a delegate for the fourth congressional district uh, here, which is most of Montgomery County, which is a suburban collar county of Philadelphia. Um, and so um, we had to go through the process like all delegates do here in the Commonwealth and collect 250 signatures at least uh, on circulating nomination, nominating petitions to get on the ballot. Uh, mm -hmm. Once we did that, uh, we filed that with the Secretary of the Commonwealth's Office in Harrisburg. Uh, and then you're officially placed on the ballot uh, in the primary election. Um, and then I was elected uh, in, in uh, our primary election in, on June 2nd. And, uh, and here we are today. Well, here you are. And we're so glad that you are here and taking some time in what will be a busy week. Kevin, yeah. it's interesting because you've said you've had some experiences in different roles. I'm really curious, how are you trying to stay engaged as a virtual delegate? And, you know, uh, and what was the process like for you when they were making decisions as the effects of COVID progressed over, you know, what, how are they getting you information? You're coming, you're not, you have a hotel, you don't. Like, I'm very curious, yeah. like what it's been like since, you know, March. We're, we're very fortunate actually to have a party secretary in the state of Ohio, Bill DeMora, who's been doing conventions probably, I think the last oh, six I know or seven. Bill. So if you know, then, then that's oh, all I need to say. But, yeah, but for yeah. everybody else that's watching out there, yeah, Bill is as well-versed as you possibly can be. Uh, obviously has connections all over the country. So he takes care of the delegation very well. They've been extraordinarily organized, regular email updates about what's going on. Obviously the balloting procedure for voting, I thought was as flawless as it probably could have been. He informed us this morning uh, that everybody obviously had, had uh, was able to submit their, their votes, which is terrific. Uh, over that two week period, we had to cast them. We actually just did have a, uh, a delegation lunch and we're having those every day of the week. So there are these, these opportunities to engage uh, where we have the speakers, where you would normally have at a delegation breakfast every morning uh, at your delegation hotel. Um, but it, it definitely is obviously a little bit different. Um, obviously, as the previous speakers were saying, there's all these caucus meetings going on and the Latino X caucus is going on right now. There's ones throughout the rest of the day as well as the next couple of days. So the opportunities to engage are there. It's just unfortunate you're not getting that face-to-face uh, opportunity and time frame. But in terms of, of, of the logistics of, of moving through the spring and, and through the summer, in terms of information, yes, just regular email updates, a few uh, Zoom calls with the rest of the delegation to kind of keep us updated. Um, we did have to send in hotel deposit forms, but those were all destroyed uh, once we found out that we wouldn't be actually doing this in person. So it's been a pretty flawless process, I would say. Well, that's good to hear. Re Rebecca, I have to say, knowing this is your first time, just curious, do you feel connected with the rest of the delegation? Is Are they trying in Maine to make sure, you know, because that's one of the great things. And I think, you know, Carlton, Kevin, you, you'll say, because you, you've been a couple of times, is like that interaction and, and meeting, you know, parts of, of your state. Um, what are, are you able to meet other people in the Maine delegation? What's happening? Yeah, I mean, um, similar to what Kevin said, we've been having Zoom meetings um, periodically just to talk about process and given updates around what's happening with the national convention. And so we're able to kind of meet each other that way. I mean, obviously there's something that we're missing that that personal um, interconnection face-to-face, -face, I, I think is it becomes much more heartfelt and meaningful and, and deeper as an experience. Um, but uh, given given the necessity to protect everybody's health, uh, this is the best way forward. And um, I know our leadership is doing as much as they can to create opportunities for us, especially this week. I mean, we've got um, happy hours um, every night this week. We've got events happening with other caucuses around the country. I mean, for me, I think that's probably what I am most disappointed about is with the Really, I was really excited at the chance of meeting folks from other parts of our country um, who are equally passionate about um, our, our party and, and our politics. Um, and I think that's going to be a lot harder um, in this kind of an environment. Um, but I'm certainly charged up for we've got an amazing lineup um, here in the state of Maine, both with the party and the Biden campaign. And so 
Um, I'm definitely going to be stuck to my computer a lot more than I normally am uh, yeah. as, a, as a senator. Well, you know, it's interesting. I have to ask, because Carlton, you know, whether it was the DCCC creating that experience for you, you've had a lot of various roles as well at these conventions. How, what do you feel about what's different about your responsibility as a delegate? And can you share a little bit about, you know, what you think your responsibility is to voters in Pennsylvania? And, you know, you're representing the, you know, Democrats uh, as a delegate from Pennsylvania. Absolutely. Well, there's no question, as Rebecca mentioned, you know, there's there's a little bit of spark taken out of it, given that we are virtual, but, uh, and you'll miss interacting with folks uh, there in, in Milwaukee and uh, across the country there. Um, but uh, this, is, this is really a unique uh, opportunity. Um, I think that uh, really what we're, what we're facing is, is a challenge, but um, it's, it's, it's certainly something that, uh, it's a privilege to be a delegate, um, regardless of whether we're virtual or not. It's certainly an honor and a privilege to serve, especially at this crucial time in our nation's history. I think that this is an election, um, as we say, seems like every year an election of our lifetime, but uh, yeah. it's certainly a crucial it, election. It always is till the next one, right? It Which is, is right, exactly, yeah. exactly. But it, it is certainly a fantastic opportunity to, to really um, to, to stand for uh, the values and the vision that, that Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris um, are exhibiting in, in the course of this campaign. Um, but my responsibility to the, to the citizens of our Commonwealth, I think, is to really take this convention very seriously, even though we are virtual, um, as you've heard the first half of this uh, series from the panelists then, um, there are still caucus meetings happening. There are still ways to engage with other delegates across the country. And so by doing so, I think that we have an opportunity to interact with folks and get ideas as to how best we can win this election, uh, because this is an election we must win. Um, certainly it, it starts on the ground, and I think that we each have a different and unique background that we can bring to the table to make sure that we accomplish that ultimate goal in the end. That's fantastic. Okay, now I would be remiss, the alumni you know, department would be terribly upset with me if I didn't uh, broach this question. But uh, you know, Rebecca, School of International Service, Kevin, you've got your bachelor's and your master's from the School of Public Affairs. Carlton, you've got your, um, certainly your bachelor's from the School of Public Affairs. Was there anything at AU that, that spiked your interest in this and your studies or like, did you ever dream that you'd be a delegate and, and at least virtually going or in the past going to, to conventions when you were on the AU campus? It's certainly a politically active campus. Let's start with you, Kevin. Yeah, well, I would say, you know, we because probably look- As they call it, you're a twofer, so we'll start with you. Yeah, yeah. We'll start with the <laughs> yes. twofer. Uh, um, I, I would say, obviously, being on American's campus, or probably, probably any school in D.C., we're all kind of the political junkies, so to speak, and everybody else <laughs> around the country looks just like we're a little bit weird and a little bit off. But, you know, it's, it's that experience that you have, you know, student government and being in class and, and having professors and having practitioners, you know, like yourself that have been involved in it as you're going to American. It just ignites that kind of excitement, I think, if you have any interest in politics, but like, boy, I'd really like to go to a convention, be it a Republican or Democratic convention, uh, as far as it goes. So it's just then just trying to find out, okay, what's the best way logistically to try to have to do that? What are the, the, the procedures and processes to do it? And, and it took me, I, I, I came home to run for office. I was successful for many years doing that, but I didn't actually run to be a delegate until about five or six years until I moved back to Ohio to do it. Because you have to, you, you've got to make the, the network, you've got, to, you've got to understand how the process works to be able to do it. But I would definitely say it was all the professors, all those interesting political experiences you have when you're at American that really kind of ignited the, the flame to want to do it at some point. Rebecca, what about you? You were at the School of International Service, so not necessarily the, you know, a lot of times people think that there's just parts of campus that are more politically active, but you're a public servant, you're going, you're a delegate to this convention, like, were you politically active on campus, or? I was. In fact, it was the first place I ever knocked doors. Really? <laughs> yeah. you got to tell us I about that. I couldn't believe it. I was the shy kid from Maine. I was wearing my pleated wool skirts and my <laughs> and penny loafers. I mean, I was really kind of a fish out of water. But um, some friends of mine convinced me to run for the student, um, was it the undergraduate student government? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I went and knocked on doors. That's fantastic. Um, and so, gosh, if you can do that as a, you know, 19 year old, 20 year old, uh, later in life, when you're confronted with knocking on doors of people's homes here in Maine, it was still a little breathtaking, but I think that that, that experience really 
um, showed me that it's impossible to conquer those fears of having to meet people in their homes and that, you know, in, at the end of the day, most are just, you know, really pleasant and, and wonderful to talk with. Um, and so I, you know, I, I served in the student government and then I actually ran and uh, served as the treasurer as well. And so I definitely think that my oh, experience great. at American set me on this path. Absolutely. That's fantastic. I didn't even know that when you were coming on. I swear I didn't set that up, but it's excited, a member of student government. Yeah. Robin, what about you? I mean, you've got your bachelor's from the School of Public Affairs. Were you a really politically active member on campus? Did you, you know, want to seek out those opportunities? You are in the nation's capital when you go to AU? Absolutely. You know, the beauty of American University is that the opportunities are absolutely endless. I mean, you are in a city where, especially when it comes to politics, international relations, anything involving those fields, you're at the epicenter. Um, so the, the, the things at your fingertips um, are, are numerous. The connections uh, are so critical. My, my advice to any student at AU um, would be to meet as many people as you possibly can, especially during your time there at AU, because again, whether it's the connections through your professors or your schools um, or an internship, I landed my first internship on Capitol Hill as a student at AU. Um, I too, like Rebecca, also knocked my first doors uh, when Mark Warner was running for Governor of Virginia back in 2001. Uh, now he's a, a sitting U.S. Senator. Um, so, you know, I really, I was very politically involved as a member of the College Democrats there at AU. And uh, again, it, I just urge everyone to get as involved as they possibly can because you never know who you can meet that could, uh, you know, present another opportunity down the road. That's fantastic. And, and that's why we certainly wanted you on because like, what an interesting, we, we wanted to talk to delegates, but to know this experience, we've got, you know, can't, classes will start next week. And I know there's been challenging for some of the students here, but I love that advice, Carlton. I don't know, Kevin, do you have advice from your time at AU too, to just students about how to get engaged? You know, I think we talked a little bit about it, but I'd love to hear more from you as well. No, I, I couldn't agree more with Carlton. I also did my first kind of door knocking back then, but it was four years before Warner ran for Don Byer, now Congressman, okay. uh, for governor of, uh, of, of Virginia at the time. But yeah, obviously, coronavirus, COVID-19 is going to make things difficult for the next semester. And uh, any students that, that's been an American for the last year or two, as far as it goes, they know the value of the institution is really that experiential learning, that ability to, to make connections, the ability to have internships in really whatever field. I mean, DC being the, the experiential city that it is, any field you want to go into, you're going to have the ability to have a fantastic internship professional experience while you're there, as long as you are going to go out and try to find it yourself and take that initiative to go do that. It's the same thing with meeting people. Uh, it's the same thing with garnering those experiences. So hopefully we're all back on campus uh, sometime in the spring and be able to take care of those unique advantages that American offers. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, it's interesting, Rebecca, I wonder, you know, you've got this experience where you're also a public servant, but like, what do you think your role is? You know, you're a delegate for this week. You've been involved with party business. So you had to be involved in, in making the decisions about our nominee and, and moving things forward. What do you think comes after convention as a delegate? What are, what are you responsible for? What do you see your role as going forward? Yeah, um, well, you know, and I'll just, just this week, I would say that I see my responsibility is to generate excitement among my, my community. Um, so I'm hosting a watch party, trying to encourage people to join me um, for Wednesday night when all these amazing women are going to be speaking um, at the convention. So this week, that's my responsibility. And then post-convention, um, you know, I've always seen my responsibility to make sure that folks understand that they have a role to play um, in our, our de democratic system, whether it's simply reaching out to me and expressing their concerns or suggesting um, ways that we can approach issues, um, to running for local office, or to even talk about running for statewide or, or national office. Uh, I know that um, with the election of 2016, uh, a great number of people reached out to me to talk to me about their desire to do more. Um, and I, I think that we, I saw that when um, the uh, caucus happened this past spring, people are really fired up. They really want to lean into this coming election and um, see a change um, in the Oval Office. So my job is just gonna be make sure that 
Um, I support everybody in the way that they would like to be participate, could be their cheerleaders, um, find people who maybe don't see themselves in that light and encourage them to do that. Um, and, um, and then continue to serve my constituents as well, because it's a really tough time out there and um, folks really need to, to know that they're being heard and supported. So I'm interested, we're gonna do a little like almost round robin. The, the interesting thing is we're going to hear from our um, nominee and the vice presidential nominee this week, which is probably the, obviously the biggest speeches of the week. But there's also a really long lineup of various um, party leaders, elected officials. I'm curious, Carlton, let's start with you. Is there a certain person you're really interested to hear their speech? Um, oh, or maybe it's, it's what do you, you know, think uh, is, is gonna be the most compelling outside of maybe the nominee? You know, it's, it's interesting. It, it, that's a very difficult question. There are so many phenomenal speakers many, yeah. um, this week. Uh, you know, uh, certainly I believe that uh, former President Obama and, and our former First Lady Michelle Obama have just this authentic ability to be able to connect with people in what they say, uh, as well as what they do. Um, and I believe that, that what they're going to say this week is really going to be a, a driving force to, to get people motivated, to get people excited, to get people um, energized and, and ready for this fight because make no mistake ab about it, regardless of what polls say right now, um, between now and November 3rd, that's, that's an eternity in politics. So, um, you know, I, I think that all of our speakers have something to, to offer this week, but the Obamas in particular, certainly uh, former President Clinton as well, um, will be uh, exciting to hear. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with our vice presidential nominee. I think Senator Harris brings so many uh, first time and uh, 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 unique uh, experiences and opportunities to to our ticket. I think that she's really going to be able to connect with so many people out there across all demographics. And I'm very excited to hear what she has to say. And of course, we're all looking forward to, to uh, former Vice President Biden's comments on Thursday. So definitely, uh, there's, there's a lot going on. And this I want week. to remind folks that it is it is nine to eleven. A lot of the networks are, are or some of the networks, I should say, are only covering that second hour uh, from ten to eleven. But it is nine to eleven p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time or, or whatever uh, time zone you're in. Um, it, uh, so tune in for those two hours because they'll be jam packed with lots of entertainment and, uh, and great speakers. Great. And Kevin, what about you? Is there somebody in particular you, you're eager to hear from from the lineup that the Democrats have put forward for this convention? Well, obviously, all of the, the main keynotes because it'll be interesting. Um, obviously, uh, Kathleen Clyde, who's been a good friend of mine since we were both coming up in Ohio. She's one of the younger keynotes that's being going to be highlighted. But I will actually, in, uh, interestingly, I'm, I'm very interested to hear what Governor, former Governor Kasich is going to say oh, uh, tonight. Yeah. It was a bit of a controversial choice among our yeah. delegation that uh, someone that, uh, that, that had advocated very strongly against unions uh, was, was selected to speak at the convention. Uh, understandably so. Obviously, he is, he is going to be supporting uh, Vice President Biden in the ticket. Um, but it's just, it's going to be very interesting to see how that dynamic plays. And if it does end up uh, attracting other audiences of, uh, of voters that we could definitely utilize for the ticket. It's going to be very That's interesting. very interesting. I'm glad you brought that up, Kevin, because there are some surprises in some of the lineup, you know. So. What about you, Rebecca? Is there somebody in particular that you're interested to hear from? I always love listening to Senator Warren. Yeah. Well, it'll be good to hear the person that you supported and so grateful I'm sure you are that she has a, a, a definitely a slot to to share her um, concerns, her vision for, for the party moving forward. So it'll be interesting to hear from her as well. I cannot thank you enough. I know you have a jam-packed week. You're going to be going to these uh, events virtually. I'm sure that you're going to, you know, spend time with your delegation and make the most of this virtual experience. I just appreciate not only as you know, um, delegates, but as AU alum, you spending some time with us um, for, and you are welcome back when we can get back to campus. You're welcome to come back to the Science Institute and we'll spend some time with you and we'll ch check in with you after to see how your experience was. For those still listening, I want to remind you, uh, we had such a jam packed program. I know some people submitted questions on Facebook. We're going to circle back and try to answer as many of those as we can. And we wanted to hear from all of our amazing guests as well. So we'll see what we can do there. But 
Also, starting next Monday, August 24th, it is the Republican National Convention. And so we're going to do a program as well at noon. We're going to talk to some key um, officials, some of our former fellows, Susan Molinari, um, former Congresswoman, Alfonso Jackson, the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and then also Anita McBride, who's a proud board member of the Sign Institute and certainly is just uh, you know an icon to me in Republican politics and a couple other more guests. We're very interested to get their perspective on the Republicans and what they're doing. So to our delegates, thank you so much. Best of luck to you this week. I'm interested to hear how you think your speakers that you wanted to listen to are doing. But thanks again for taking the time today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Everyone, Andrew. don't forget to, thank you so much. Don't okay. forget to join the Sign Institute. We expect all of the people in our panel and everybody who joined to sign up for our newsletter, sign up for our social media channels. I guarantee you there's a lot of great programming to come. Kevin, Rebecca, Carlton, thank you so much and have an incredible week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.